Done. All right, well, thanks, uh, Frank. So hello, everybody, and welcome to this inaugural version of the AAS YouTube channel interview. Uh, this time, we decided to, uh, to play a little game and uh, exchange the roles. So I will be your host today. My name is Andre Persia. Uh, I am uh, a pretend astronomer that uh, lurks around Villanova. Uh, and Frank interviewed me uh, about a month ago. Uh, and I kind of figured it's unfair that he does all the question asking and that we have to turn the tables a little bit and put him in a hot seat and see what the man that needs no introduction actually does for a living. So uh, Frank, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to this. I think uh, it'll be lots of fun for the audience to get to know you as well, not just uh, the people who you talk to. So uh, can you first introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you are, what you do, uh, to, sure. to get the people the idea of who you are? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Frank Timmies. Um, uh, what do I, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I've been here for uh, about as long as I've been a scientific editor for the journals, uh, so about 12 years. So it's the longest I've ever lived in one place. Uh, my dad was in the military when I was a kid, and so moved around every year, <clears throat> new place every year. Um, so I got used to moving quite a bit, uh, and it's only recently I've sort of somewhat settled for 12 years or so. So I'm at Arizona State University, uh, where uh, I do the usual professor gig. Uh, so teaching research and service. Um, Research-wise, I do STARS, um, broadly defined. Um, teaching, I specialize in very large online courses. I've been, uh, here's a hint, I haven't been in a classroom in about 10 years. Um, I have been, <laughs> I've been teaching, I got on the online train real early um, and that proved to have some, some uh, wisdom people wanted to hear about when COVID hit last year and so how to do things online. Uh, so uh, there's a very nice uh, series on uh, Double H YouTube channel on teaching online. I like to cook, I like to swim, I like to bike ride, um, well, in days past, before I had children, um, uh, I would go on two or three month bicycle rides. So uh, things of order 1500 to 3000 kilometers, uh, take a month or two going around. Um, and once I had kids, well, that didn't quite work. Um, so I like to say that bicycling is part of my past and it's part of my future. Uh, so my daughter is about ready to uh, leave the launch pad. And so I'm already looking for what my next bike will be and I would really enjoy getting back out on bicycle touring. Well, Arizona to Pennsylvania is not that far, so hey. Um, there you go. Maybe you'll get a visit. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, really wonderful. Let me let me uh, kind of uh, cherry pick a little bit. So you said you you've been the longest in Arizona for 12 years. So out of all the places, where did you enjoy the most? Ooh, that's a um, Every place has its pluses and minuses, you know, uh, whether whether it's the weather or the amenities or um, things. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't I don't I don't think I really have a favorite. Um, I will say when I was a kid, because my dad was in the Navy, uh, spent a lot of time on both coasts, bouncing back and forth from one to the other. Uh, and so it wasn't really until I was in sort of in my mid twenties that I uh, spent some time in the Midwest, Chicago land. Uh, but I've been down south. I've been I've been all over the USA. Well, not I, many people can brag about that, so that's pretty cool. I enjoy Phoenix. I, I do not mind the weather at all. I sort of like the heat, especially if it's a dry heat. Uh, Small storms. Uh, and in storms, yeah, we do get uh, the summer storms, the haboobs rolling in. Um, these are dust storms, uh, very large dust storms, like it's a huge wave of dust coming in. It's pretty amazing to see one. But, well, yeah. we, so they've all been good. Many of us have observed at Kitt Peak, so it's always fun to see all the dust devils around. And mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It's not quite Phoenix, but still. Uh, yeah, Tucson is, you know, order 90 miles or so, 100 miles to the south. That's right. So, uh, how, how can you tell us a little bit about how did you get involved with the AAS in the first place? And then how did you uh, kick start the YouTube channel and the, the uh, journal series? Uh, okay. Um, all right. So I came to Arizona State University in 2008 is when I started. And uh, they brought me in as a, as a full professor. So I'm a little unique and I skipped the whole tenure track bit. Um, not because I didn't pay my dues. <laughs> um, but that's why they brought me in. Uh, and so when I first came in, then at the time, uh, Ethan Vishniak, who's the editor in chief of the APJ, used to put ads in the uh, job register, the double H job register. And so when I got there, there was a job ad for um, somebody to be a scientific editor for the journals. And I'd always sort of eyed it. Um, and so it turned out to be the shortest job application letter I ever wrote. It was a single sentence, um, just that I I'm, I'm feel uh, motivated and qualified to provide quality service to the community. And that was it. I was a one-liner. On wow. um, so Ethan picked it up. Uh, we had a little chat. Um, and it went from there. And so I've been a scientific editor for about uh, 12 years. I'm enjoying it. I still have fun doing it. Um, the, so one of the reasons why I got into it is, is you know, I used to read the journals a lot as a graduate student. Um, it, I was, so I did my grad work at Santa Cruz uh, Lick Observatory. And so I would spend hours and hours in there chasing some line through the literature. Um, but as time went on, I found myself, you know, life goes on. I found myself reading the journals less and less. And I didn't really like that. Um, so I figured a scientific editor would be one way to force myself to read the journals. <laughs> um, and it's true, it does happen. Um, oh, the curious thing about the scientific editor when I started is, is uh, Ethan wanted somebody to do Cosmic Rays MHD, uh, which I don't actually professionally do. Um, uh, I could now. Um, <laughs> So I still take most of the Cosmic Ray MHD papers, uh, um, uh, although it's not my professional forte. So, so that's uh, I branched out since then, but I still take all of those those papers coming in. So, um, is yeah. that a heavy volume? Um, by volume, no, it's not the largest volume. Um, so I should say these days I'm heading up the um, high energy phenomena and fundamental physics corridor. Uh, some of the cosmic ray papers can be challenging to find a referee for, if only because um, they're kind of like a LIGO Virgo and they slurped up almost everybody in the field. So Ice Cube, for example, um, or you know, if you're not part of Ice Cube, then you're part of one of the competing large experimental efforts. And those can be a little challenging to find uh, people who have not yet um, been slurped up. Um, but uh, by volume, no. But the high energy corridor is growing. So the largest corridor in the AAS journals right now is Cosmology and Galaxies. That's headed up by Chris Consolis. Um, and the second uh, in growing is the high energy and fundamental physics corridor. Because everybody likes to think they do fundamental physics. Um, uh, so that one's growing. Uh, so we recently added a, a new SE, um, who I won't mention right now. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit, oh, so okay. So I started my SE in 2000 and whatever it was, 2008, 2009. I became lead, lead editor of the Corridor when they instituted Corridors uh, in about 2016 or so. Uh, and then somewhere around 2018 or so, around 2016, I started going to all the AAS meetings. So if you go to the AAS meetings and the AAS publishing, I started hanging out at the booth. Um, and we have bright, shiny objects to give away. So um, in fact, they kind of look like this. Oh, nice. I, I have 
a whole collection multiple yes, times. Seven, seven corridors. Um, and so I was, you know, uh, evangelizing the journals a bit. Uh, and so um, around 2018, uh, the AAS bumped me up a little bit to ooh, senior lead editor. Uh, and most of that was to evangelize the journals. <clears throat> So I had created this, this presentation on how to be uh, how to be a good author, um, what to expect as an author uh, when publishing the double edged journals. And so I had this talk and I kind of gave it around. And I was looking around for ways to um, propagate the journals. And so I poked around and I discovered that the double had this YouTube channel. And uh, it had been started in 2014. It's lost to history who actually started it. <laughs> but when I look, got there, um, you know, by this time, it's about 2019 or so. I'm coming up on two years. Uh, it had, um, you know, all of like four videos. Uh, the last video that had been uploaded was four years ago. Uh, had all of like 22 subscribers. And I was like, you know, I can, I can do something with this. Um, you can bump it to 25. Hmm? You can bump the number of subscribers yeah, to at least 25. Definitely. I can definitely do that. Um, probably 26 is my limit. Um, <laughs> um, and it's what, 1500, give or take right now? It's around 1300 right now. Uh, it's growing pretty good. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. Um, or you can ask about it. Um, so that's when I started, we're coming up on the two year anniversary is when I started posting regular content on the AAS YouTube channel. And for the first year, I pretty much spent the time on the journals proper. So, uh, you know, history of the APJ, of the AJ, what's the business model, current business model of the journals. Um, um, how, I put my talk on there, right? So how to be, uh, what to expect as an author, how to be a good referee. Why do we do double anonymous reviews? Um, so really journal specific. Um, and I was still sort of building my little studio that you see behind me. So some of the videos are a little cracky on the quality, but um, that's primarily on me. Um, it's also what makes them charming though. Hey, oh, <laughs> if you say so. Um, <clears throat> and so after I had done that for about a year, I mean, I mean, a stick of gum only has so much flavor, right? And so, okay, I sort of chewed a lot of the flavor out of talking about the journals. And so now what? Um, uh, so you can always revisit those topics. And lately I have been. Um, so I was looking around for, for what to do next, how to expand the scope. And I didn't want to compete with Susanna Kohler's uh, AAS Nova, right? So she will take an article and she will give her take on it and, and put it out there. So I didn't want to compete with that. Um, and so it was actually Kevin, so we're poking around what to do. And it was actually Kevin Marvel uh, who made the suggestion of, well, maybe try interviewing authors. And I went, well, that's an idea. Um, and so that's how it sort of started. And it just so happened that it happened to be around when the pandemic started. Uh, and so it wasn't planned to be some substitute or you know, pandemic um, activity. It just worked out that way, that there was sort of a, a captive audience for a year or so. Um, and so for the past year, and it's coming up on the one year anniversary on April 29th, will be the two year anniversary since I've been doing this. Um, and so that's how the AAS Journal's article uh, author one started. And I decided to try and always keep the content fresh. So there is a new release every three days. Um, it has since expanded from just being the double edged journal author. So I will now do uh, the other scientific editors, your scientific editors. So you can um, you know, learn who your scientific editors are. Um, so I've done a good fraction of the scientific editors. The AAS also picked up Sky and Telescope. So I'm now doing Sky and Telescope articles, um, pick up the amateur astronomy. Pro-Am um, astronomers, uh, those tend to do pretty well. And um, the newest series to get started is, which you had the inaugural kickoff, is on the eBooks. Um, so generally planning on doing about a new eBook about once a month. Uh, so I've already contacted the author of hopefully the second one. 
Uh, don't want to mention name because they haven't accepted yet. Um, but we're going to try and do the ebooks um, once a year. And so that's how it sort of got started. And that's sort of a long story, but hopefully somewhat entertaining. Um, <laughs> but that's how I got started. Well, if it's like that on inaugural one, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be charming like you say it'll be charming <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saying that but yeah <laughs> uh, um so yeah that's how it sort of got started and you know it's so you know there's a lot of youtube channels that do the popularization of astronomy the discoveries in astronomy and those are perfectly fine and you know good sized ones will have several uh you know several hundred thousand to a million subscribers, um, Veritasium, the PBS, right. um, 60 Symbols, um, and there are others. Um, but what we put up is, is pretty unique content uh, in that it's research-grade astronomy um, for the double-edged journals uh, ones anyway. And so that's just unique and you get to hear people talk research grade astronomy right it's hardball astronomy we're not you know there's no hype around some discovery or you know this that or the other um but i'd say the beauty of it is it's still distilled so that everybody can follow right yeah 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 with some bit of jargon because you know you're going to sling it a little bit um but people can follow it and the other unique thing is it's different than a talk right you're actually talking about your article um, whereas if you give a talk, yeah, you'll pull some figures out of your, your article, but you're sort of wrapping it up in a different mode and you're delivering it, you know, um, in a different, different mode. You rarely, if ever, get to actually talk, you know, go through the paper with somebody. So it's got a, it's got a lot of uh, unique content um, to it. Uh, you know, I have, I'm under no illusions that we'll have some, you know, million hit viral video. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know it's just not that kind of a content i um, think this video might get oh ooh, a couple of million you know um uh so yeah it's it's uh it's going i'm happy doing it for a while um you know i'll keep doing it for a little while at some point it might be interesting to have more other people do this um, you know, just to get variety as a spice of life a little bit. So having other people do interviews with other authors um, would be great. Um, kind of like, uh, you know, Susanna for AAS Nova has Astrobytes, right? So these are generally grad students who are interested in science writing. And so they contribute pieces to AAS Nova. And so I can imagine sort of a sister or parallel program or people who are interested in, in doing some uh, be blogging or, you know, video stuff to giving them an opportunity to, to stretch a little bit and put some of those videos up. And you're the first example of somebody who's not me <laughs> who's leading the video. <laughs> I may uh, work on my one sentence application for the job. There you go, there you go. So uh, let me ask Frank, uh, th this is tremendous obviously what you're doing. Uh, I, I think professional astronomers all too often uh, have little regard or at least little spare time to devote to, uh, to actual uh, dissemination of knowledge, not only among the, the most narrow of the fields that they work in, but truly to the public. Right. So this is, this is a phenomenal service, not, not just to the AAS, but to astronomy as a field and science as a whole. Uh, so, so I'll comment on that. So one of the other interesting thing is it's interesting to put the face of the person to the paper because otherwise just a name on a paper unless you happen to be you know in that subfield and you go to those meetings you don't really know who that person is so it's a chance to it brings out the human element of of the articles uh a bit um and the other thing is uh i suppose we'll know have we've made it or made an impact um uh with imitation being the sincerest form of flattery so i'm waiting for some of these other um well, let's be kind, other astronomy journals <laughs> start having, doing the same thing. <laughs> I think it'd be wonderful. Uh, I think this is a great model for, for how to attract interest, not just a five minute interest 
to see what's new in astronomy as a whole, yeah. but you need to try to delve deeper into some of the questions that uh, people actually talk about what your research is. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. right. So uh, if we if we step away from the AAS just for a second, uh, you said that you're interested in in stars as as the the I'll say the umbrella of your scientific interest. Can you tell us a little bit about those interests and especially the scientific questions behind them that interest you the most? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, how did I even get into it? So that's always, how does anybody get into the field they do? Um, so, So I did my undergraduate in physics at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and then I took quite a bit of time off and I went and worked up in Silicon Valley, uh, primarily doing software, uh, device physics. Um, so transistors and power MOSFETs and whatever. Um, and a lot of it was on the modeling side of the house, how to model these devices or how to string them together in circuit simulators. So I worked for uh, foundries in the Valley that actually made chips. And then later I went and worked on in software companies um, who made software products for the chip industry. Um, and in some, in the meantime, um, you know, I'd always have sort of had this background interest in astronomy. Um, and then 87A went off. And of course that got a lot of um, oomph. <clears throat> and uh, in some moment of idealism, I decided, uh, okay, I'm gonna go back to grad school. I wanna do astronomy, um, get away from the practical stuff of chips, right? You, you didn't uh, really like money is what you're saying. Uh, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> I was a sieve on money. Oh, it was terrible. Oh, just terrible, terrible, terrible. It took me a while to get disciplined. <laughs> Oof. Um, uh, but no, I like money. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I looked around and I decided that I wanted to do nucleosynthesis. So when I applied to grad schools uh, in 87, I applied to 50 of them, I think, 47 or something like that. Um, and I'd already sort of picked out who sort of who I imagined the players were <laughs> in, in nucleosynthesis and hence stars, because the idea that you know stars make a periodic table is just endlessly fascinating to me. Um, and I probably heard it first when I was 10 years old, you know, listening to Carl. Um, uh, and so I ended up going to Santa Cruz. Um, that was my, my choice in part because I was living in the Bay Area. Um, so Santa Cruz wasn't too far away. Um, and so I went to Santa Cruz and I sort of still had my eye on stars. Um, and then eventually I hooked up with uh, that first year, I hooked up with uh, Stan Woosley. Um, and so Stan became my thesis advisor, and uh, at that point, stars were, were set. So I like the fact they make elements. I like the fact they put on light shows. Um, and over time, my interest has broadened um, across the HR diagram, uh, and then uh, into chemical evolution because they do produce uh, elements. And so um, I have an interest in that. A little dormant, I have to say at this point, but I still have an interest in it. Um, uh, and then because of my software background, I, you know, over time, I just kept, I've been giving away software since I started basically. Um, so it was before GitHub, before SourceForge, before there was even a term called <laughs> open source, I was giving it away. Um, uh, and so I produced various, helped produce various software instruments along the way. Um, and so Flash was one of them. This is a, it's a 3D hydro code. Uh, so I contributed that. Most of my expertise in that is in the microphysics. So things like thermodynamics, equations of state, um, nuclear reaction networks, things along those lines. Um, so I put one of those out and uh, then another one came along called Mesa modules for experiments in stellar astrophysics. Um, so I helped push that out the door and still involved in MESA. So it's not only just the science question, but providing the tool sets 
facts to enable other people to answer their science questions. That's sort of a driver of what I do. Um, if you want to talk about what I'm currently researching, okay, that's a fair question. Go so I'll go. <laughs> before, before I uh, challenge you on that question, uh, I'm guessing Richard Stallman must be uh, one of at least uh, uh, many of the role models because uh, he obviously advocates for complete freedom of, of uh, mm -hmm. intellectual property. Well, he's a character. He's a character. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Certainly. Um, for, for those who don't know, uh, he's the guy behind uh, the general public license um, and uh -huh. trying to convince everybody that open source is the only way to go. Yeah. Um, so uh, but before uh, we talk about what you do right now, let's uh, talk about Mesa a little bit because um, okay. I, I think it's one of the hottest kids on the block. So uh, the, the history is particularly fascinating. It's, it's another person uh, leading it, at least the initial effort, that comes from outside of astronomy to make this huge impact in astronomy, uh, talking about Bill, of course. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about that story and then how you got involved? Yep, <clears throat> yep. yep. Uh, in fact, I have a presentation on this. Um, so it was approximately uh, 2005. I have the exact date. I still keep the email. <clears throat> uh, so I get this email. Um, it says, hi, my name is Bill Paxson. Can I please use the um, software tools on your web page? Because I've been given this away for a long time. Um, and so I looked at this and I, oh, this is a weird message. Um, and it was weird for two reasons. Number one, they're hanging off my web page. So you can just take it and go. Um, that's my license. Um, <laughs> um, so it was very unusual for somebody to ask if they can use it. Um, and so I looked at the, the address and it was coming from uh, UC Santa Barbara. And so I figured that it was a graduate student of um, Lars Bildstein, a new graduate student. He was just being uber polite. <clears throat> so I replied and, you know, okay. Uh, and then three, about three emails later, I'm going, this guy's no graduate student. Who are you? <laughs> and it didn't take too long to figure out who Bill was. And I was like, oh boy, we've got a ringer here. Um, uh, so for those who don't know, uh, so when Bill was a graduate student in, uh, at Stanford, so Bill's a computer scientist, uh, there's this demo out there called The Mother of All Demos. Uh, and it is the demonstration of basically the entire paradigm that we use today in computing. They had to invent the mouse. So your mouse dates from this. So Bill was on, if the, you know, it was sort of like uh, Alexander Graham Bell and Watson on the telephone. So the uh, professor Doug Engelbart was uh, in San Francisco. Bill was in Palo Alto. And they are demonstrating remotely video, shared editing, um, you know, the whole paradigm. <clears throat> Um, so check it out. It's called the mother of all demos. There's still videos of it. There's still stuff around it. Um, uh, but Bill wasn't done. So Bill graduated, um, ended up working at Xerox Park for a little bit. And so we actually had an, uh, Bill was a little bit before me, but I also worked at Xerox Park for a little bit uh, in my Silicon Valley days. Uh, and then Bill left Xerox Park and became one of the most earliest employees of Adobe. Uh, and so then what Bill and others uh, invented uh, at the time was uh, scalable fonts, right? So up until then, all fonts were, were rasterized. Um, and so the instantiation of scalable font technology was something called PostScript. And PostScript forms the backbone uh, of PDF. And so if you've ever handled a PDF, if you've ever handled a PostScript document, there's a little bit of bill in there. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of bit of bill in there. Uh, and so it was the ability to, to uh, put a vector font uh, either on paper uh, 
So it's infinitely scalable, right? You don't get uh, pixelization as you go up and down. But the other driver at the time was uh, what was known as display postscript. And this was driven by Apple wanting to put vector fonts on screens so that if you blew something up or down, the uh, scale didn't you know, all of a sudden pixelate or get too small to see. Uh, and so a lot of that was a, a partnership between um, Apple and Adobe driving that. Uh, but Bill is a, the primary inventor of scalable font technology. And so Bill stayed at Adobe for about six years and then he left. Uh, and he did what you might do if you had early Adobe stock. <laughs> um, yeah. Good, good for him. Um, and so time went on and for whatever reason, he decided he wanted to do something in stars and he settled in Santa Barbara, um, still there today. Uh, and so he reached out to, to Lars um, and that's circa 2005-ish. Um, and so that's was how I met Bill um, and it has been going ever since. Um, uh, yeah, so meeting in 2005, 2006. So the first Mesa instrument paper was in 2011. So that's about how long it took uh, to, to come up with something that would be publicly usable. Um, and there was a lot of thought before that first paper came out on, okay, what if this thing actually hits? You know, how are we gonna handle this? Um, you know, what's, what's, what's the plan here if this actually dings? Um, and you'll see a little bit at plan. I think, still think it's the only um, APJ paper that has an appendix called the manifesto um, where we lay it out. This is going to be an open source stellar evolution instrument, which was a first at the time because uh, everything before that was closed code. You had to do the secret handshake and know somebody and maybe they'll do a model for you. Um, and so this was going to be sort of the democratization of stellar evolution. Um, uh, yeah. And so um, it ended up did hitting. Um, and Big so one of, the, one of the innovations that we do is we put out an instrument paper about every, on average, every two years, sometimes a little shorter, sometimes a little longer. Um, uh, because anybody who's ever written software knows that by the time the paper comes out describing it, it's already out of date. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so trying to break that mold of, you know, putting out one code paper and you don't hear about this instrument for another 20 years in the literature. Um, so doing a steady drum beat, much like doing a steady drum beat on the WS YouTube channel um, of, of what's new. Um, uh, and it's still going, still going strong today. It's just doing well. It accounts for about the plurality of, of stellar models in the literature. And people do, because it is open source, people do all kinds of things with it. So it's fairly used in the cosmology arena. People will put in different particles with different cooling and see what, what limits they can put on. Uh, for example, if you require stars to have blue loops, as they go through their loop, then how massive or how energetic can this particle be before the blue loops go away? And so you can put limits on, on um, cosmological stuff or varying Gs or think dark stars, um, things along those lines. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it's going well. And uh, I'm happy to say that, you know, Bill, for the Mesa team, uh, took home the 2021 uh, Tinsley Prize this year for his contributions. Uh, the Tinsley Prize is awarded for innovative contributions. And I think what's particularly notable about this one is it's the first major prize, um, double S prize, um, given where it specifically calls out open source software. And I think that's, that's really great. Um, it's a good start. Um, I think there should be more. Uh, and Bill certainly started Mesa, no question about it. Um, uh, but these days it's a team effort. And so I'd like to see sort of prizes evolve. <clears throat> because there usually are teams of, from small to very large. And on the very large, you can think of things like AstroPy, <clears throat> which have a very different development model, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, where a prize can go to an entire team uh, as opposed to an individual, um, which is not, you know, Bill absolutely deserved it as the individual. He certainly got the ball rolling. Um, he's still a pile driver. Um, on the development side. So, so that's a little bit about Mesa. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's actually an extremely 
uh, well taken point that I can't think of a single truly notable project led by a single person. It's it's yeah. it's truly yeah. a collaborative effort because uh, you know more heads mo no more, and if you put them together, so it's natural that talented people, especially with some software background, can do much more if if they yeah. put their heads together. Yeah, and and to be honest, you know, uh, uh, I mean, this is one of the things you know we thought about up front, right? A successful software project. Uh, takes a village, right? Not everybody can or should be a coder. That's there's, right. lots of, there's lots of other things associated with running a successful software project, academic software project at least, that, that need to be done. Uh, somebody needs to do the science form with, with the instrument. Right. For one, demonstrate this thing, you know, can do leading edge science at the time. Somebody has to do the business case. Um, you know, somebody has to evangelize. Uh, there's just Somebody has to test. I mean, there's just so many facets where you can make a really valuable contribution without being, you know, a primary driver of changing the source code. Um, and so I just want to help put that out there. It's not necessarily strictly writing source code. There's a lot of, a lot of elements to it. Yeah. Um, so, so let me maybe stress one of those elements, uh, which is part of the public outreach for the code. Uh, okay. You've been heavily involved in, in summer schools for Mesa. Oh, yeah. can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, OK. So let me talk about what the goal is and then how that fits in the goal. So the experiment I'm running is, uh, can you have an open source academic software instrument that lasts for, I say, I said 40 years, I'll still say 40 years. Uh, that is it, the, the driver of the field for 40 years. Is that possible? Um, and 40 years is a relatively long time. Uh, it's gonna go across at least one generation of researchers. Uh, and so, a very early effort was pushed, was to push for growing your own next generation. Um, develop your community. Uh, and so the Mesa summer schools were a part of that um, intention to grow the community. Um, besides helping people know how to use the code better and for their own research. I mean, yes, there is that very immediate impact uh, and Pete, you know, it's like a boot camp. You know, you come out and you are much better <laughs> at, at uh, you know, how to use Mesa for your particular research. But it had a larger driver behind it, which was to grow one's own community. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we've been doing that for 2000 and, since 2012. So the first year after the first Mesa Instrument Papers when we started the summer school. The summer schools also are a way for if it gives people a way to progress sort of through the Mesa community. So first they'll come in as a participant and, you know, if they're engaged, they do, then we move them up into the TA position. And so we run a four to one uh, TA to student ratio. And that's to get a lot of hands on because we don't want anybody floundering. Uh, and so typically there's a table and there's three participants, which can be faculty. So faculty, you're welcome to show up. We call them participants, not students. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then one, you know, bona fide black belt Mesa TA uh, at the table, and it helps that whole table move forward without getting bogged down on something. Um, uh, and so we run about 40, 45 people per school. We've been running it since 2012. Um, didn't run it last year for all obvious reasons, unfortunately. Uh, and since it's still sort of with us, but we couldn't just, we just not possible to skip two years in a row. So we are running a 21, 2021 Mesa Summer School, uh, but it will be online. Um, hopefully it would be the only online we, we ever do. There's something just very valuable about doing it in person, like a school like that. Um, Coming from a person who's specialized in online teaching of, of large classes. Yeah, so there you go. What an incongruent thing. Um, uh, and you get to meet Bill, right? So Bill does show up at the Mason Summer School. You know, you can, you can chat with him and you meet some of the principals. Um, but anyway, it was a way to, so people will start off as a participant. And if, you know, if they're engaged and they go and they look like they're, you know, 
willing to help people. Uh, then we invite them back as a TA. Uh, and then from a TA into the lecture position. So we're creating this whole community moving forward. And then, you know, we do a big push on uh, trying to get Mesa um, principals into stable positions, shall we say, or named postdocs or things along that line. So that when they go up and they, you know, have their own students, their own postdocs, they are using Mesa. And so this gets back to the goal of 40 years. You've got to get that next generation trained, have them use their students to do it uh, so that it becomes the de facto tool for the community. And uh, yeah, that's the Mesa Summer School about me. So let me ask one last question on Mesa, because I'm curious. Uh, a piece of code is never complete, right? And once you have it written, then you realize, oh, I should have written completely <laughs> differently. <laughs> so yes, my yeah. question to you is, uh, obviously, it's, it's a ginormous piece of code that a redo is entirely unpractical. But is there any segment of it that you would like to do a complete makeover? This happens all the time in Mesa. So currently, the Mesa developers is uh, a group of uh, 15, 16. Um, uh, and there is always stuff being rewritten. I mean, that's one of the uh, I think that's one of the innovations that we put on is that the pace of development is just unrelenting. Um, uh, it's also one mechanism by which we've avoided forks, right? So it is open source, so somebody can make Sally's Mesa and Bob's Mesa. And, you know, and the reason people fork generally is because they're not getting what they want. And so they want to go in and put something in. And so by always keeping it the pace really high and giving people what they want or what they need. That's a very important part. Um, we haven't seen any forking, there won't be any. Um, but no, I mean, just we had a conversation the other day where, you know, we are talking about, you know, redoing things that were done eight years ago uh, and completely, you know, redoing it. This is, you know, the core. I mean, there's, there's a high dimensional root find. Um, there's a Newton Raphson method going on. Uh, and rewriting that because it looked good eight years ago, but things got more complicated. You've added stuff in, you've added new capabilities. And so after a while, it looks like a bunch of band-aids around the thing. Um, uh, so at least within the Mesa project, we haven't had a problem where a piece of code has been so stagnant and not touched that, uh, oh, this is going to be a major pro project to redo this. There's always tinkering um, and, and porting. So for us, it's not that big of an issue. Um, again, going back to the 40 years, whether it's an issue in another 10 years or not is a TPD, uh, but at least historically, it has not been an issue for us. Well, the clock is ticking, so uh, we should have this uh, conversation again in, what, 25 years and uh, see Absolutely. where we're at? Absolutely. I'm sure I'll be younger. Of course, it's how it works, right? It's pure <laughs> nature. <laughs> so uh, let me let me ask now a little bit about the the current research uh, interests that you have. So so okay. what boggles your mind mind these days? Uh, okay. Um, well, I should talk about what my graduate students are doing since they're doing their things. Uh, so I have two fascinations at the moment. So one of them um, uh, is white dwarf seismology. Um, I decided to get into that game because um, diamonds. No, I just got annoyed by some things I saw. So <laughs> the only way to do it was okay. I, I, the only way to do this is to get into it. Um, so I got into it. Um, I, so I have to interject here for just a second. The reason why is uh, Don Kurtz, who's one of the world's leading astro seismologists. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever he's talking about seismology, he usually says, well, you know, carbon enrichment. And then when you compress carbon, what do you get? You get diamonds. So he always yeah. says, you know, the twinkle, twinkle little star song. Little did the author know that they knew exactly right when they said uh, twinkles like a diamond in diamond. the sky, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So yeah, the carbon will crystallize out before the oxygen um, as the white dwarf cools. And so you get... Uh, Crystallization of carbon, hence a diamond. Um, world's largest diamonds. Um, 
So we've done, so it's a new field for me, right? Um, so we've got out our first two papers in the last two years, and we've got plans for about three or four more coming on. Uh, I don't want to completely spill those in this video. Um, uh, but as a, as a sort of a non-card carrying white dwarf seismologist, right? I don't come out of, you know, one of the, the main centers on this. Um, uh, you know, hopefully we can put some unique takes on it, some different takes on it. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm excited where that's, that's headed. Um, so can uh, you give us one cool result that you're particularly proud of? Okay. Um, so I suppose in the early days, right, when you didn't have Kepler and you didn't have tests, right, if you could get the periods within, you know, 10%, well, you, you, great, you know, it's astronomy, <laughs> you know, 20% is great. Um, but these days with tests, you know, and Kepler giving the periods of G modes to seven significant figures, right? <clears throat> so now you can start robustly probing stuff um, uh, that you couldn't probe before. Um, and so I happen to be particularly interested in the profiles, the composition profiles of the interiors of white dwarfs. And so one of the papers that we just got out that my graduate student led was uh, the impact of NEON 22 on G mode um, periods. So NEON 22 is a natural product of stellar evolution. So all the CNO, when a star is born, uh, gets converted into nitrogen 14 during, on the main sequence during hydrogen burning. Um, and then during helium burning, there's uh, a nice critical little reaction that converts all of that nitrogen 14 into neon 22. So if you like, neon 22 is the metallicity of a white dwarf. So if your initial metallicity of CNO was you know, 0 0.02 solar metallicity, by the time you get into helium burning, all that is a neon. So the neon mass fraction is 0 0.02. And so the question is, what does this do to the G dwarf white dwarf period? So what we found is uh, that it impacts the periods uh, by about 1%. So on the one hand, you can go, oh, 1%, who cares? Um, but as a just mentioned, uh, these, we know these to six, seven figures, you can start probing this question. And so as it turns out that when people do sort of a traditional chi-square fit, so, the, so what do people do? So they, they take the, uh, uh, they have the G-mode periods, they've gotten the luminosity curve, they've done their Fourier transform, they get the periods of, of the white dwarf. Um, and then the traditional way of approaching this is to start with an ab initio white dwarf, and you specify the composition profiles, the carbon oxygen profiles, um, until you get a reasonable match. So you start with a hot white dwarf, cool it down, down the cooling sequence with some preconceived, you know, pre-notion of what the composition is, cool it down until you get into the area where the white dwarf you're trying to uh, model is and, and twist the composition until you get as good a match as you can. Another way to do that is, is uh, to do templates, right? So I have this, flexible template of what my compositions are. And again, I cool the white dwarf down until I get, and I move my template around until where I get it. Um, and you do a, a, a chi square on that. Um, so uh, traditionally, because you didn't have Ke Tess and, and, and Kepler, people ignored me on 22, right? But as it turns out, when you do your fit, when you just use carbon and oxygen, basically, uh, you get fit precisions of, of about 0.3, 0.5%. So if I'm claiming that NEON 22 makes a 1% effect, you basically have a systematic effect going on in your fits. And so if you include NEON 22, you can do an even better fit than what you're doing before. So that's one, I think, I think cool um, result that we found some systematic that, that you know, um, had been ignored for all these years and basically enabled by the precision that you can get Tess and Kepler light curves from. Um, uh, yeah, and so ultimately my goal here is to be able to say what the interior profiles of white dwarfs are. Um, uh, and by extension, put an astrophysical constraint on the nuclear reaction rates that produce those profiles in the first place. And yes, there's mixing, I get it. There's, there's all kinds of mixing, um, I get that. Um, <clears throat> but you can still put an astrophysical constraint on something you can measure in the laboratory. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, so that's one. So I've got it's a way stuff. better than what regular astronomers think of white dwarfs. When we think of white dwarfs, we just say ah, it's just a pile of degenerate electron gas. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell a story on that one too, but that's maybe for another time. How I first met Chandra. Um, 
Uh, yeah, anyway, that's another story. So my second graduate student is working on something um, uh, different. Um, so everybody knows what an HR diagram is, right? <laughs> Photon luminosity on the y-axis, effective temperature on the x-axis, at least if you're a theorist, and I understand color magnet diagrams, I get it. <laughs> um, uh, and so sort of in some burst of inspiration, we asked, well, what if you change the y-axis to put the neutrino luminosity and you had a neutrino HR diagram? What does that even look like? Um, and now, and the reason, the driver for that is, is because- And these are just electronic neutrinos? Oh, well, there's, they come in two flavors. So there's thermal neutrinos uh, uh, from the thermal bath. You have all the usual processes. Uh, if you can do it with a photon, you can do it with a neutrino. So all the processes you're familiar with photons happen with neutrinos as well. There's bremsstrahlung, there's plasmons, et cetera, et cetera. So these are thermal uh, driven processes that produce neutrinos. And then there's also, uh, uh, weak reactions um, th that will uh, convert uh, a neutron into a proton or vice versa and then release. So there's, there's reaction neutrinos and thermal neutrinos. And which one dominates where is also a topic of our paper. So this is Farag et al, just to put a plug, um, 2021, where we produced the world's very first uh, neutrino HR diagram. And the reason why this is interesting is there is a new generation of neutrino detectors coming out there. Um, that are lowering the sensitivity uh, or increasing the, I should get that right, increasing the sensitivity of their detectors. Uh, and so for example, super K with gadolinium. So they've doped their um, detector, their pure water with gadolinium. This uh, gives them a better energy resolution and lowers uh, the, the, the sensitivity of objects you could detect. And so currently if there is a pre-supernova going off within um, a kiloparsec, super K with GD, gadolinium, should be able to detect the supernova 10 hours before um, the star explodes. Well, this is really cool for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, if you can detect those pre-supernova neutrinos, then you give a heads up to the electromagnetic and gravitational wave communities, something's ready. coming, <laughs> get ready. <clears throat> um, and you will see the signal because if you really are picking up these pre-supernova uh, signals, you'll see the signal rising because the star gets closer and closer to core collapse. It produces ever more neutrinos and you will get a very distinct signal of what that looks like. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, 10 hours. And so, so how many stars are we talking about within a kiloparts? How many massive stars? Supernova candidates within it. Uh, there's Betelgeuse and Tyras. Very good, very good. Betelgeuse is everybody's favorite these days. Um, so there's about 30, there's about 32 candidates. Is what you're talking, but that's currently. And so, and there are other experiments, neutrino astronomy experiments coming on. Juno is coming online. Um, there are several dark matter experiments that are being converted over into uh, also look for neutrinos. So I think that now is the time to lay your money down on neutrino predictions. So we're trying to help, we're trying to give predictions for neutrino astronomy to go after. Yes, you know, if you want to do a low mass star, okay, you're going to have to wait a little bit because your orders of magnitude down. But I liken the situation to, you know, as it was 30 years ago with gravitational waves and, you know, Joe Weber's aluminum cylinders, you know, may or may not have been shaking, <laughs> you know, and so people would do gravitational waves stuff. And why are you doing this? I mean, nobody's ever going to detect this. And it's the same thing I think with neutrinos now. Because you, you know, give it another 30 years and you just don't know when the next innovation is gonna come that's gonna drop the sensitivity. Um, you know, and a neutrino astronomy will be sort of in the same vein that gravitational wave astronomy is now. It's a new messenger that we can actually detect with some degree of regularity. Um, and so one of my graduates is working on that. And so I'm interested in neutrinos coming from stars. So let me, let me uh, follow with two very small little sub questions about that. So uh, I'm not sure how much the audience is familiar with the Super Kamiokande experiment. Uh, so uh, can you just remind everybody what that is? And the other one is um, we know that neutrinos tend to oscillate. So there's this Kabibo Kobayashi Moskawa matrix that tells us essentially how those oscillate. So so how does that affect your your neutrino HR diagram? How does that work? Uh -huh. 
Uh huh. Uh, so Super K is, is an experiment uh, in Japan where they fill up a large underground tank of very pure water and they put photomultiplier tubes around those. Uh, when a neutrino comes in, uh, it may strike one of the protons uh, in that water and um, that sets off um, uh, a weak reaction. And what you catch is the flash of blue light jerking off radiation um, from the electron that is emitted. And so because you've got tubes all around, you can tell the directionality of, of uh, uh, back out the directionality of where that neutrino came from. Um, uh, and so that's the basic Kamiokande detector. When they add gadolinium, uh, also in a weak reaction, so the neutrino comes in, it pops some proton, out comes an electron, which you do detect with the Cherkov radiation, but it also puts out a neutron, which until they added gadolinium was undetected. But gadolinium has an, uh, a hilariously large cross-section for neutrons. So it's a neutron sucker. And so the neutron comes up, the gadolinium sucks it in, puts it the gadolinium in an excited state, and then decays down. And you can detect that gamma ray coming from the de excitation of gadolinium. And so now you catch both items coming off a weak reaction. And uh, this is basically what is dropping the sensitivity. And it also gives you a little better directionality as well. Um, oh, and so if you're interested, uh, if we do get a pre-supernova within a, a, a a kilo parsec. Um, uh, you can use something like super K with gadolinium to tell which supernova. Wow. Is. So it's, you know, it will depend on the sensitivity, but you can, you know, get some directional out of the sky. And, um, you know, there's only four candidates. So it not only will be able to tell the gravitational and electromagnetic communities that one's coming, but it's going to be over here. <laughs> So again, I think you know neutrino astronomy has uh, has got a good growth path, <clears throat> and so um, that's why Eve is going to be working that first thesis. Yeah. Oh, and then for the uh, and so so your your so the oscillations is a good question. I don't have a great answer for that right now. It's one of the things we're going to be we're looking at. It clearly oscillates in the sun, right? This is you know neutrino is non-zero mass. That's that's a well-known thing, uh, and this is one of the things we're looking at. Um, as we move this research project forward. Exciting. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me, uh, cause we're coming on top of the hour. Let me take you back to, uh, to worldly affairs. So whew, let me, let me try to recap this. So you're a family man. You Ew. are working in academia, have a very productive, active academic life. Uh, you spend a, a significant amount of time contributing to open source projects. Uh -huh. And then spearheading the AAS YouTube channel and contributing uh, as the scientific editor. Seems like how, how do you, how do you manage to balance all of that? Uh, especially, <laughs> and this is very relevant uh, in, in the time of pandemic, where uh, many people find it very difficult to uh, to to find a correct balance, and uh, it's entirely important to yep. find this balance to, to live a happy life, because otherwise you can burn out. So what's your advice? How do you do that? And how should other people try to mimic what you do? Oh, God, don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, terrible. Um, <clears throat> um, I do think that life work balance is important. It helps. Uh, so doing other things outside of what one does professionally. Um, so I do like to cook. Uh, I'm fairly reasonable in the kitchen. I enjoy it. Um, Invitation, everybody. I have a particular penchant for desserts. Um, uh, so I enjoy spending time in the kitchen, uh, making stuff. Um, I also enjoy just being active. So getting out and swimming or bicycling or whatever it may be, but you know, getting the heart rate over 60 is a good thing. <laughs> also clears the cobwebs out. I mean, one of the things I really liked about going on really long bike lights, you sort of reach as you're going, you know, and you're laying out, you know, 80, 100 miles a day, you sort of go into this Zen state um, where it's almost noiseless, right? There's all this stuff going on, but your head is very quiet. And, and um, that's a nice clearing out of things. Um, and so I sort of try and reach that 
it's not the same because uh, it doesn't last as long. Uh, but try and just reach that neutral. I'm cooking. I'm swimming. I'm doing just blank out. Um, get into what you're doing. Um, yeah, um, I sleep less. <laughs> Plenty of time to sleep when you die, huh? Uh, you know. I'll typically go four or five hours of sleep uh, on a given day, and that'll go on for six, seven days, and then I'll crash and I'll sleep for 12, 13 hours. So I do a little makeup. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how it all happens. Like and it's just multitasking. But the more you multitask, the more, you know, the better you get at it. So um, you just also learn efficiency uh, uh, just to make things move. So. Yeah, frequently perfect is the enemy of the good, huh? Uh, yes, you just want to move the ball forward. <laughs> Perfection may or may not ever occur, but um, you'll just move the ball forward and that's the progress that you want to make. So anyway, that's how I do it. Um, all right, well, let me ask one last question. Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite citation from any historic figure or any friend that you know? Some either a saying or, or a sentence that really resonates with you in life that, that you would like to share with everybody? Oh, God, I probably have 470,000 song lyrics in my head. Um, well, let's try with 370 <laughs> seconds, please. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Uh, wow. I wasn't ready for that one. Uh, I know. I'm good at putting people on the spot. <laughs> wow. I don't know if I have one. Um, oh, man, I'd have to think about that because. What's your favorite band? Oh, although for, uh, for various reasons, um, you know, we're going over uh, epitaphs with my family members, my immediate brothers and sisters for various reasons um you know what would be our epitaphs and our, our gravestone well what would be yours uh so the one i wrote down that seemed to get some sort of a reaction anyway i don't know if it's good or bad but um uh, uh he came here without being consulted and leaves without his consent <laughs> I love it. So my sister went, well, so it all worked out in the end, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Frank, wonderful. It, it, was, it was such a privilege and such pleasure talking to you. Uh, you I, really, I really hope that the audience had gotten a glimpse into uh, what an awesome Crazy editor awesome. they have uh, to, to take care of their scientific appetites. Cool. Uh, Thank so you very much for oh, absolutely. It, it Thank really you. has been my pleasure. I think I'm going to have you do more of these. <laughs> I, I'm submitting my one-liner uh, uh, in the near future. You got it, man. All right. All right. So thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And hope you enjoy Frank for the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.